also his primary responsibility is, is uh, an individual that, that gives up part of his day, uh, instead of flying, to sit out there on the end of the carrier and provide that safety valve to the uh, naval aviators that are landing their uh, mighty warships uh, aboard the carrier. I had a lot of respect for the Tomcat. It was a very challenging airplane, very powerful airplane, but you had to stay on top of it. At that time, I was flying the A model uh, when I did my uh, cross train in the TF-30. And it was one, of the, one of those airplanes that you really had to respect, you had to ma maintain the airspeed. When that airplane would get underpowered, it would pick up rates of descent that, frankly, if you didn't arrest it quickly, it was unrecoverable. One of the big things as a uh, LSO is that we monitored was uh, meatball, lineup, angle of attack. Meatball is the glide slope, angle of attack was the airspeed of the airplane, and uh, lineup was uh, keeping the airplane on center line. Uh, Tomcat had an amazing uh, large wingspan. The only thing second to the Tomcat in wingspan was the E2. So it was critical to keep that aircraft on center line. Generally plus or minus three feet to make sure the safety margins are maintained. It was um, some years later uh, when I had an opportunity to uh, to fly the uh, the Hornet and I was, in fact was qualified as a as an F-18 pilot at that time and joined uh, joined the air wing. Uh, it was a squadron LSO and uh, we had a turnover of the uh, senior LSO, the CAG paddles and it's the carrier group uh, paddles. And I was asked if I'd step up and, and assume the senior LSO responsibility. The uh, deck was moving around a little bit, uh, and that kind of gets in a pilot's head. And we had a few pilots that, uh, that had some challenges, and one of them was a Lieutenant Matt Clare, a planet. And uh, I recall him having just a horrendous day. Uh, landed, landed well short, uh, did get his hook across the uh, ramp, but he was a taxi, taxi, one wire. And there was considerations not to, to even let Matt fly that night. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the leadership, uh, made a decision we were going to fly him, but they also made the decision that I was going to wave him. And uh, I you know, I said, no problem, I'll sign, I'll wave Matt, I can control him. And it's a partnership you have with every pilot uh, on the carrier that, you know, I'm there to help you on those dark nights. Uh, I'm there to give you those little sugar calls, power calls, lineup calls that you may need, that you may, get, you know, not realize that you need to make. But there's a partnership between me and the pilot to keep them safe. I'll never forget that night after, you know, a challenging day. Uh, everybody was going back out there. It was the first event. Uh, it was just after 9 o'clock. Uh, it was so black. I mean, you could not have made the sky blacker uh, or darker. And, and the deck was had a nice, steady pitch of about 10, 15 feet. And it would it'd hang up there and set, and then would settle down about another 10 or 15 feet. And as a pilot, you can see that uh, out there, way out there, you know, five, 10 miles. You're looking at that deck, and you can see that shape, that rectangle out there. And it's the only point of light source that you have. And it's tempting to just stare at that. But we were always told, you know, get in the cockpit, get on your instruments, don't transition to that outside scan until you get into three quarter mile and call that ball. And I saw Matt out there, he was the first guy down. We purposely had the lineup. Uh, we have a, the JBD jet blast deflector right behind us. And we had grease pencil, we'd write the names up there. And I saw Matt, you know, one, one, one. Uh, he was the first uh, aircraft coming down. And I knew that we wanted to get him down first because if he had challenges, we put him in, put him in the downwind pattern. We tank him, we bring him back around, and give him a couple laps and, and uh, but uh, I told uh, all the paddles, Pup McFadden was, was uh, out there with me. I'll never forget Pup, he was a, uh, uh, E2 paddles, and uh, I said, Pup, I want you to back me up. He was a pretty senior LSO, had a wing qual. Airplane was coming down the chute, getting ready to, to have some words with him, and he called the ball, or his whizzo it was uh, a Dean Fuller, Dino, uh, was in his back seat, and uh, you, re you recognize voices, and of course I recognize Dino's voice, and Dino made that call. Nice, Christian line, 111, three quarters of a mile, slightly above, slightly right, call the ball. 111, Tomcat ball, 70. Ball, you only have about 30 seconds, and in fact, I recall it being 25 seconds. And I uh, rogered the ball, and immediately I could tell he was just a little bit underpowered, so I gave him your, your little slow, as I recall. Two power calls. Down, 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 down. Whoa, power back on. Power, power. And then immediately it was uh, four wave off calls wave off, down, wave off, wave, wave off. Wave off, wave off and you, you, when you hear the airplane, you can hear that TF-30 has a whistle about it. When that air, aircraft rolls back, that motor rolls back, you, you know you got to be on top of it immediately. And uh, so, while I did give them a little power, or uh, you're underpowered or uh, a little slow call and a couple power calls, those four wave off calls had to be acted upon immediately. Unfortunately, Matt had made up his mind that he's not going around as dark and he did not want to go around that night. And he'd had a bad day and landed short. And, uh, 
he was going to use that same te technique at night, and, and it just worked. It wasn't going to work out for him. And I can remember holding that handset in my hand, that pickle in my other hand, squeezing that pickle, turning those red lights on, which is a visual indication for the pilot to go around, immediately at full power. But I could hear that TF-30 uh, rolling back. And it's just a whistle. You just hear it getting down, coming down. And I just could not believe what was happening uh, in front of me. And I walked out to the length of of the, uh, I'll never forget, I walked out to the length of the headset cords and the only thing that was holding me in position not to walk right out in the middle of the landing area uh, was the fact that the tension on those cords were holding me into position right across the scupper. So I was out in the landing area and I just, I just couldn't believe what was happening. It just kept coming, it kept coming down, kept coming down, kept coming down, down. Meanwhile, Brick Hunters was in the back called the Peanut Gallery. Got a number of uh, guys out there that want to come out and just watch the show, you know, watch the airplanes uh, coming down the pike. And he grabbed, he's seen, he's seen it immediately. It's slow. It was just the most horrendous thing I can ever remember in my life. A little emotional. Uh, shipmate. Uh, you, take, you get personally involved with these guys. Uh, and Matt, uh, unfortunately, would not survive that night. Uh, aircraft impacted right at the uh, round down, broken half. Um, it was standing right there, and it just got really hot. Uh, I may have had a, a sort of curse word, the F word, uh, as I turned around and, and I kind of braced myself for the impact of the airplane it was, as it was breaking apart and just engulfing the, uh, the landing area. Um, in fact, I carry a, uh, re catch myself here, I carry a little uh, reminder every day, I got a little scar on my arm here. The TF-30 fan blade uh, left, its, uh, left its mark on me. I was looking down at my feet and the airplane was fan and it's full ammo, uh, sidewinders, Phoenix uh, Sparrow, as I recall. The airplane was completely loaded with weapons. 20 mic mic, and I'm looking at my feet. I'm trying to discern what, what I'm looking at. It's part of a belt of 20 mic ammo and, a, and the warhead off a, uh, of an A9. And, and I hear this voice behind me, let's get out of here. Uh, and it's Puck McFadden. And I don't even recognize him because it was just so hot. And the, the, the scuppers were full of jet fuel and the, the flight deck was on fire and there were just pieces of airplane everywhere. Thankfully, we were, we were able to expeditiously clean up the flight deck, get a couple wires uh, stretched across the, uh, across the deck and, and start recovery. And we were able to recover uh, 17 airplanes without issue, didn't fight a single uh, motor. And uh, it was a tough night. And it's uh, July 20th, 1993, forever be seared in my heart. <laughs>